wonder if Troy got um, busy with clients, maybe. He wasn't on our team meeting this morning either, so I'm not sure. No worries. You at home, Ryan, or in the office? Um, I'm at the office. Nice. <laughs> Give people another minute or two and then we'll get started. Hi, Kaylin. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. All right, you guys ready to get started? Thanks so much for coming. Awesome turnout for everybody. Really loving that. You guys are awesome. I think everybody's pretty familiar with the Zoom tips and tricks, but just in case you're not, I try to throw them in every class. Um, I also posted the workbook for the class in the chat in case you don't have that as well. So that's there. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to use the chat option. Um, I'll try to look at it sporadically um, and answer any questions that you have. If somebody else has it open and somebody posts a question, feel free to stop me too and we can, we can go over that. So I'm kind of running things differently today. Um, I'm in the office and normally I have dual screens, but today I just have one. So we'll see how well this, this goes. So welcome to Buyer's Conversion and thanks again for coming. Um, today's class, again, we're sticking with the same new structure that we've been doing, keeping it at one hour starting now. Um, and instead of going through all the information, we just try to focus on mixing it up, bringing your guys' conversations into play and having guest agents. We have Ryan and Ann here today to talk about kind of how they do their buyer's process. Guys, thank you so much for coming. Um, we have Troy too, um, and he might pop in in a little bit. He said that he would give um, 
some feedback also. So if we see him pop in, we'll, we'll grab him. Um, but that's really awesome. You know, it gives everybody the chance to um, hear different ideas, generate different ideas and ask questions around um, the content. So we're really thankful to our guest agents. Um, you know, we talk about the importance of sparring, uh, study, practice, action, and reinforce, and we believe that, you know, the most value comes from that. So anything that you guys get today, be, be sure to, you know, take that to the field, apply it, and then bring back, you know, what worked, what didn't work the next time we have this class, because then we can generate more ideas from that. Um, I'd also kind of highly encourage everybody to look through the book in your downtime. Again, there's a lot of dialogue in there, a lot of tools and great ideas that maybe we might not cover um, today in the Zoom meeting, but are there for you to use as resources as well. And so um, as long as nobody has any beginning questions, we'll just dive right into um, buyer's conversion. So I just wanted to give you guys um, a quick recap before we turn it kind of over with questions to Ryan and Ann. Um, but, you know, what is this course about? So buyer's conversion teaches agents kind of the five stages of effectively working with buyers. And since this course is a conversion course like listing conversion, we're assuming that that lead has already been generated. And now we want to imagine that we're going to, you know, attract those clients or those buyers into establishing working relationships with us um, and getting into that first initial meeting. So the strategy taught in this course is to kind of develop a relationship based selling strategy. Um, and it takes you through five stages of working with a buyer. And we're going to kind of go over those with Ann and Ryan. Um, some important things to remember is, um, you know, with before we look at the five strategies is with every strategy in your business, you know, it's important to be intentional and proactive. You want to have a strategy and you want that strategy to work for your clients. So constantly, you know, change it up if, if things aren't working or mold it to fit um, your different clients because everybody's different, um, whatever you have to do, but have something in place. Um, you also want to make sure that you check your attitude before interacting with buyers. Um, accepting the core beliefs allows you to kind of get prepared and remain focused and professional, but it also gives you some, kind of some key talking points to fall back on when you're in a conversation with your buyers. So if you have some downtime, I highly encourage you guys to look at kind of those key beliefs um, and checking your attitude sections at the beginning of the book because they're really valuable. Um, and then within every strategy, you know, the every kind of book that we have kind of goes through those 47 vital listing activities or buying activities. Um, you know, kind of take that as an example. It's from a find a closed system. Make it your own, however you're comfortable with as far as your business model is concerned, but have something in place like that, um, even if it's just for yourself as a checklist that you can use when you're dealing with buyers, no different than listing conversion as well. Um, and then be sure that you're tracking kind of your key indicators of success. Being able to say things like, you know, I have a 98% sale to list price ratio or a buyer satisfaction rating or a percent of car riders who find and buy, those things can really set you apart from the competition and also bring value to, to the buyers and information to those buyers. It kind of sets you apart. Um, and then finally, we need to kind of stop inviting buyers to have, you know, to presentations. We always want to have a conversation instead, you know, the concept being like, hey, let's meet, let's have a conversation and kind of see if we can build a relationship from there. Um, a presentation always kind of comes across wrong. It comes across as you just being that teller and we don't want to be that teller. We want to be more consultants and, and provide information. So after this class, you guys should feel pretty confident um, when entering working relationships with buyers, or at least we hope so. Also, we're recording this and putting it on YouTube. So feel free to come back to it um, anytime that you need it if you're working on a, on a new buyer. So let's have um, a conversation around kind of buyers today. So Ryan, how would you kind of describe buyers today? Um, buyers today, I think are still hesitant because I feel homes are selling real quick, but they think they're overpriced yet. And so I think they're hesitant to do anything, but with the market that we have, they need to be a little more reactive and, react quicker. So I think that's one of the issues I'm running into is, you know, there's a new listing comes online. I think it's perfect for my buyer, but they're not acting quick enough to get it. Right. 
Um, and do you, do you have anything to add on like how you would describe um, kind of buyers today? Mm -hmm. Oh, and you were muted. Can you unmute? Sorry. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. It's like, I agree with Ryan. I think buyers are more hesitant right now. They, uh, I've got an older couple and they are very reluctant to do anything with the current situation. So they're just kind of hanging back and looking at stuff online. But then again, I've got other buyers that have already lost out on properties. And sometimes it takes them losing out on a couple before they realize you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then they do, you know, when that one comes on, it may, may not be 100% what they're looking for, but if it's in the location they want and they can fix it up, you know, then they are finally putting the offer in. Absolutely. Um, some other like keys that we found um, that agents are describing buyers to along with hesitant um, could be frustrated, maybe. Um, oh, I know a lot with like COVID is happening right now, so they could be showing frustration. Um, I saw Troy jump in. Troy, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I was going to kind of um, ask you. Thanks for coming, by the way. Um, I was going to kind of I'm ask sorry, you. I'm sorry, I was late. I was showing. Oh, no, I'm, that's exactly what you need to be doing. That's awesome. Um, but I was going to kind of pose that same question to you. Are you finding, um, you know, any differences with, other than hesitation that Ryan and Ann were talking about as far as describing buyers today? Yeah, you know, I've, <clears throat> I've noticed that too with folks. And I think that's a big part of our job as agents. Um, you know, one of the things Jason always tells us is that, you know, we're the, we're supposed to be the calm in their storm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're here to educate them too and educate them on what's going on in the market, um, uh, the trends and things like that. And, you know, one of the trends is that, uh, you know, now that COVID is relaxed a little bit, or at least in this area and the governor's opened things up a little bit, it's going to be ridiculous. In the next couple of weeks, um, if any of y'all get asleep, um, I, I don't even know what to tell you because I think we're all going to be showing and showing and showing. And, um, but I think it's important that we're, we're doing that. You show 10 condos and they find that one and they go home and they say, uh, well, you know, we want to think about it and we'll get back to you. I'm like, okay. And then we'll look at some other ones because this one won't be available. And I think it's important that we, as, as the professionals, educate them in what they need to do. And that it's just like I had a conversation with my folks this morning and I said, um, it's been on the market for 15 days and this is super cool. And it's not gonna be here in two or three days. And they've already lost out on a couple homes. I'm expecting an offer this afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, what are you guys finding right now is like, the best way that you are communicating with your buyers? Is it still very much in person? Is it more virtual? Um, I've always had really good luck with email. And I, whenever I first had my first initial contact with my clients, I always ask them what the best source of communication is. And 90% of mine is through email. Mm -hmm. So I email and stay, I mean, I've got my whole database set up to where I have it broken into separate categories and the categories that my hot buyers are in, I am in constant communication with them and it's all through email. So the only time I'm on the phone is if I have a hot client and a new listing just came on the phone or on the market, I call them right away because rather than waiting to get an email out, I'd rather call them at that point. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, if we're dealing with offers and stuff, but a majority of mine's all email. Gotcha. I util utilize email, but I also utilize Facebook because you can still keep in contact with a lot of your people through that way. I mean, just so they know you're still around, you comment on their, maybe their picture of their grandkids or, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on. But I have also called a lot of my past clients that I talking for a long time just to say hey just wanted to check in and see how you were doing and you know um Chelsea and I had some dock and dine magnets 
made up. So that's cool. I was calling them. I was using it as an excuse to find out their address, make sure they were still living where they had been living. And I, it was really nice to reconnect with some people that you hadn't, you know, talked to and you kind of put off calling, but you know, they know you're still interested and then they, you know, know you're still in the market and mm -hmm. they'll send a referral. That's great. And I love that. Are you doing that? Um, like just, just when you're on Facebook, you're just commenting and liking things from your clients and, and maybe direct messaging occasionally. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have my Facebook page also my business Facebook page. So I try to post the new things on there, like which waterfront restaurants are opening this weekend or like mm -hmm. zip line that they have at paradise. Mm -hmm that type of thing, just to let them know there are still things going on here and come in and support our local businesses. Mm -hmm. Troy, what are you kind of finding with communicating with your buyers? Is yours still um, via email, phone, Facebook? Uh, <clears throat> basically, text and email probably the most. Um, kind of like what Ann said and what Ryan said, I, I mean, uh, kind of trying to do everything depending on what the individual client prefers. One thing that I would add to that is that, you know, when you go out and show property, every time you show property, call them the next day or text them the next day at, with a simple text that just says, Hey, I really enjoyed uh, meeting you yesterday. We looked at some great things, uh, some good, great properties. Um, do you have any additional questions? It gives you a super easy uh, opportunity to make another contact with them um, versus that awkward, hey, what do you think about 123 Main Street, you know? And so just just reach out to them and say, you know, uh, you got any other questions? Can I get you any other answers? Maybe you get that answer back that says, um, we're contemplating a... Uh, um, an offer and uh, uh, we'll get back to you this afternoon. Those are all great suggestions. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you guys too for some of our new agents that are in this group before we get into the um, five stages of working with the buyer is can you guys kind of um, explain like the risk that comes with working with buyers for some of our new agents? I mean I know they have that saying like buyers are liars. Can you elaborate kind of on that buyers are liars <laughs> <laughs> sellers are yellers but I don't miss sorry Troy go ahead no I just said buyers are liars and sellers are yellers <laughs> <laughs> go ahead Ryan I was gonna say I don't necessarily follow the book on a buyer's agent's guide here. I'm not, I don't require anybody to sign a buyer's agency. I kind of feel if they want to work with me, they're going to work with me, mm -hmm. but it has um, came back and bit me a few times on it, but kind of with what I've lost on losing buyers that way, I've gained, I think other buyers by not forcing them to sign something. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at on that. No, I love that. I mean, even if you have it signed, it doesn't mean they're not going to buy it for sale by owner. Because I had yeah. that. I showed them, wrote maybe two contracts, three contracts. They lost that. Buy <clears throat> for sale by owner, had a buyer's agency. And they just quit answering my calls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it well, can happen even if you have one. Yeah. Unless you want to pursue it, it doesn't go anywhere. I've actually heard of from a lot of our agents who have taken this class previously too that they do kind of the same thing, Ryan. They don't really do a buyer's agency all the time, or mm -hmm. they may feel uncomfortable getting them to sign a buyer's agency. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, just to expand a little bit too on the on the risk that comes with buyers, also is you know a part of having this kind of five stage process or a process th that you utilize with your buyers is that it minimizes and kind of points out where the buyers are in the process as you go through it. So you can kind of weed out those people that are just looking to look and may not be qualified or 
you know, may want to buy, but not right now. So doing that kind of approach can kind of eliminate and get you to working with people who are only motivated, willing, and like able to buy right now. So um, just something to think about, especially if you're new to the industry, that um, that can happen in the field. And we're going to talk about it here in just a second. Um, but now I want to just get into the five stages of working with a buyer. Um, lots of questions here for, for our guest agents, but I really appreciate you guys again. Um, you know, since time kind of reveals all, um, we always want to be sure that we're working, like I said, with real buyers. So when the phone rings and we want to kind of immediately transition them into our strategic approach, typical agents, they just kind of want to throw them in the car. Um, but we want to be more than that. We want to, you know, take control, identify what their needs or wants may be, um, and make sure, like I said, that they're motivated, maybe qualified or loyal. Um, and can you tell us like what you do when you initially have a buyer call you or get a buyer as a lead over the phone? Well, when somebody calls me, um, what I'll do is I'll try to develop a rapport with them to begin with instead of just automatically answering their question, like how many bedrooms is it or how much is it or mm -hmm. look at their phone number. A lot of times you can tell where they're from. They might be from central Illinois, where I was from. And I'll say, hey, well, where do you live? And, you know, just try to develop a relationship with them from the beginning. And then you'll be surprised because you might have something in common. Uh, mm -hmm. And then um, I uh, have a buyer's questionnaire that I use and use it on a colored piece of paper and then write the date, or write the source of the lead, their name, try to get their information, try to get an email at least. Um, you should have their phone number because they called you obviously. And then try to find out what they're looking for. Maybe if when they're calling on, is it quite right? Try to find out what they need. And I try to get them established in the um, uh, matrix in a search, you know, develop a listing cart for them and tell them they'll find out about, you know, new properties right when they hit the market. Mm -hmm. So, and then find out also if they're working with anybody else, you know, I mean, do you have a contractual obligation to another agent? You know, um, if they do, then let them work with that one. Um, and then find out also if they're approved, if they want you to send them lenders, mm -hmm. what information, you know, how familiar they are with the lake, you know, so they know what area they want to be in. A lot of people have no idea. Mm -hmm. So I just go through my, my checklist and that gives me a good idea of, you know, what they're hoping to find and if they're being reasonable. No, I, I like that you bring up um, the fact that you have a checklist to try to get as much information as you can when you get the lead on the phone. Uh, Troy and Ryan, do you guys do pretty much um, the similar similar structure? Um, can you kind of elaborate like how important it is to communicate with them as soon as you get that lead? I do agree with Anne. I think a lot of the things she does is a lot of what I do too. Um, it just really depends on what they're calling for. If they're calling about a certain property, asking about just a certain property, I try getting them to go look at that property. Whether I think it's the right one for them or not, I just like building a relationship with them in person right off the bat rather than over the phone. Mm -hmm. So I kind of... Uh, I build a good connection with people when I actually meet them at a property. Yeah, so you try to get them ahead of time and meet them mm -hmm. as soon as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. I think it's just super important that uh, do what works for you. And I know as new agents, there's new agents on this call, um, and they don't know what works for them because they have had two buyers or three buyers or five buyers. And, um, you know, when you've had 500 buyers, it's easy to kind of weed out um, some of the things that work, some of the things that don't. And some of the things that work for Ann don't work for Troy. You know, I mean, I, mm -hmm. she's very organized. Um, I'm more kind of fly by the seat of my pants type thing. And, um, you know, I have a nice conversation in the beginning with them, try to get some information um, and make sure that you know, they're working with a lender to get pre-qualified and tell them some of the positives and the negatives associated with that. And I'm sorry about the phone. No, it's okay. Um, 
but uh, uh, yeah, it's just uh, you, after a period of time, you got to figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I like that. Not everything works for the same people. And like I said at the beginning, all buyers are different people too. So, you know, you're not going to always have the same particular type, type of people that you're dealing with. So you can kind of bend it and shape it how you need to. Um, Troy, how do you combat like a buyer who you get as a lead um, who just wants that emailed to them? Like, I don't really want to talk on the phone. I don't really want to meet you in person. Can you just email me stuff? Like, what do you say to those particular clients? You know, what I do is I, uh, at that point, I, I don't put them in my, necessarily my hot buyer file, which I don't even have that. I, I have uh, um, just a list. I keep a list of buyers that I'm working with and um, a different, I use a different highlighter on that list as to what I'm working with um, when they're a hot buyer. You know, if they just want stuff emailed, I just, I'll send them an email and um, with a follow-up in a couple days. And uh, uh, for the most part, they're not really a hot buyer till they, they want to have a conversation or at least a text. If we can get to texting back and forth, sometimes that, uh, that's what that buyer prefers. And um, uh, one of the things I tell my folks, I tell all of them is I work super hard for my clients, but I'm not, I'm not pushy. And I don't come at them like a spider monkey, you know, um, I just, uh, that, that works for me and it's very appreciated by my clients. If you're sending out two or three emails a day, all you're doing is pissing them off. Mm -hmm. And so I just not, um, that's not my personality and everybody's personality has to, um, has to work into the equation. I like that you keep bringing up um, text and email. Have either of you three um, had any positive results from doing like bomb bomb versus just a standard email? I don't do bomb bombs. No, that's okay. I'm just curious. No, I do bomb bomb. Mm -hmm. I like it. I actually have a uh, a little video that I made that's a hey, let me introduce myself. Oh, so great. For not for somebody. I mean, somebody that you just get an email from, you know, like if it's in some type of a lead, you can send them the, the bomb bomb, the little video, just so they can put a name with a face. and. Really yeah, I've had a lot of. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and to answer that too, is that uh, one of the things Jason told us in the beginning, and you might notice that I go back to that quite often because Whittle's a pretty good educator. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he throws a lot of tools into our basket and things he's, but he said, you don't have to use everything and do it just fair. Do a couple things really good and mm -hmm. you have to figure out what works for you. Bomb bomb works for Ann, doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. That That's exactly what I was about to say is, you know, there's no right or wrong, but if you can just take a couple and pick and choose and just implement them and get better with them over time, that might be the better way to go. Um, what are you guys doing to qualify buyers before you meet with them, like on the phone? Are you asking any qualifying questions to know that it's not like a waste of your time? I, I still don't do a whole lot of qualifying even over the phone. Like I said earlier, if I have a buyer call in and they wanna go look at a property, I'll go show them that property and that's where I do all my qualifying and see where they're at is in person. Cause regardless if they're ready to buy today or they're ready to buy in a few months, I've built a connection with them in person now mm -hmm. to where hopefully when I put them in my database and I follow up with them every so often, like I do, um, when they are ready, they're going to come to me hopefully at that time. Mm -hmm. Ann and Troy, do you, yeah, I agree with, I agree with Ryan. Um, I do that too. I ask them first if they have been pre-qualified. I don't, it's not a requirement before I take them out to show them properties. Mm -hmm. I'll ask them if they want a local lender list, you know, and try to let them know it's a lot easier transaction if you use a local lender. Um, but I'll, I'll show without them being pre-qualified. Right. Because like Ryan says, once they yeah. meet you and they know, you know, if your personalities 
mesh and they trust you, then, I mean, you're halfway there right then. Absolutely. And, and I do the same thing as both of them as well. You know, it's, you don't want to lose a buyer over, well, you have to get pre-qualified before I'm going to pick you out. You have to do this before I'm going to put you in my car. No, because then they're going to go over to um, Old Banker or Reese Nichols and work with somebody that doesn't require that. So don't lose them. Just, just work with them. And don't be afraid to fire a buyer. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that's important too, is that I had a million dollar client that was just a complete jerk. And I was a policeman my whole life and I'm tired of getting yelled at and I'm not going to be yelled at and treated with disrespect. So you've got to figure out if you can work with the buyer as well. And it's, it's a relationship back and forth. You're representing them, but you've got to be able to figure that, um, that relationship out too. And maybe it doesn't work. Yeah. I love that. I send those people to Ann. <laughs> Thanks, Troy. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's transition into like the client coming to the office. I mean, we've done, we've talked about kind of the pre-conversation activities, this first part meet in the office kind of, we're right there. So Ryan, can you tell us kind of what happens when a buyer comes to your office to meet with you? Like, are you involving your admin at the front desk at all? Are you going to the conference room or your office? Yeah, normally if I have clients come to the office, it's for something important, whether they want to tell me exactly what they're looking for or we're going over an offer or contract. But I always bring my clients into the conference room. I think it's a little more professional in there than if they were in my own little office. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do it all on my own. I don't really require help from any admin or anything like that. Um, and then I'll sit them down and just go over whatever it is. If it's want and, wants and needs we're going over, if we're going over a uh, offer or something, we do it all in the conference room. That's great. Um, and what are you kind of doing to establish that like win-win relationship when you're first meeting? Like what questions are you kind of asking to build rapport and get close with your clients? Well, like I said before, I mean, you try to establish a connection with them. That way they learn to trust you. But when they first come into my office, I've got a whole packet of information that I give them. And I try to find out whether or not they know the lake. You know, if you, you explain the mile markers to them. A lot of people don't realize there's five different three mile markers. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I give them in this packet is I give them one of these nice maps. I mean, they're huge maps. They love getting those. And then... Um, That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I give them our dock and dime magnet. <laughs> I always put a Missouri Brokers Disclosure form in there. That way you can prove you've given them one. Um, that way they have it. I put a copy of the buyer's agency agreement. I don't necessarily go over it all, but I put it in there. That way they have it. Um, and then I have just a, some sheets that I go through just mm -hmm. to try to find out, um, let, let them know what the issues are. Like if you've got a, a what Ameren permits you need, you know, and just try to educate them on the lake and tell them how important it is to use a, a local agent and use an agent that is a full-time agent that knows what they're doing, that, is going to represent them in the best way possible. And just, you know, try to make it light and um, establish a relationship, like I said, so. That, that's great. I love your packet. Those are a lot of great ideas in that packet. Um, Troy, can you tell us like what your first initial meeting with buyers sound like? Like how do you begin to uncover their needs and wants and do you prioritize them? So let's say I get a phone call in to the office. Um, they want to look at property 123 Main Street. And so we're looking at that. And um, maybe that house has gone contingent uh, from the time that they saw it on Zillow, which we all know is always updated information, to the point that um, then, I, then I start with, so what are you looking for exactly? I mean, are you looking at certain part of the lake, you know, um, size home, lakefront, 
whatever, all the criteria is associated with that. I don't have to go down that whole list. Um, and then where are you from? And maybe they'll say, oh, I, I live in Kansas City, north of the river. I'm like, oh, really? I raised my kids in Park Hill School District. Then, then you got a bond that you're trying to, to develop. And so you kind of go from there. And then you find out, and I found this out, well, my kids went to Park Hill too, and then blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I'm Brandon Meyer's father and Amber Meyer's father. And they're like, I know Brandon Meyer. Well, there you go. So that you just try to find those things that, that you can develop a relationship with and start that. Um, uh, and when I get done with, uh, you know, we leave the closing table, I tell folks, Hey, you know, this is a relationship. This isn't, this isn't Troy selling you a house. Sorry. This isn't Troy selling you a house. This is, uh, um, you know, this is a relationship. You call me if you need a plumber, you call me if you need an electrician and the people I just got done showing this morning, we just had dinner a couple, a couple of days back and we're friends and they trust me. And when they trust you, then you, you're going to answer their questions and they're going to believe you. When I told them today, I said, you guys are going to need to shit or get off the pot on this house because it's not going to be available in five days. And they know I'm not trying to sell them a house. I'm trying to sell them the right house. Mm -hmm. uh, Ann and Ryan, can you elaborate to you more on that? Just uncovering needs and wants and, and talking with them kind of what that sounds like. I think Nail or Troy nailed it. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest thing is just I, I'm myself around them. I don't put on a show or act for anybody. So whether it's a million dollar buyer, buyer or a twenty five thousand dollar buyer person, a lot I'm the same person with each of them. That's a great point to make. It doesn't matter the price. I know when I talked to um, Jane Kelly the other day, she she had kind of said the same thing, and I thought that was a really cool statement. It doesn't matter the price of the home or who the client are, you are who you are kind of thing. I agree. You just have to be yourself. I mean, have you guys ever got any, like, um, off-the-wall, like, wants or needs with another property that a buyer was looking for? <laughs> it's okay if you have it. I was just curious. Yeah. Not on the wall that I can think of. Yeah. So, um, what do you guys say to clients when they just say, "Well, I'm just looking." That's fine. I mean, it's fine. You can, you can look. Just I want to be your agent. You know, when you're ready to make that purchase. I'll work with you. I don't care if it takes a year, as long as you're committed to me, I'll be committed to you and help you through the whole process. That's good that you threw yeah. like- a, Yeah, that's where it thing. goes in. Sorry, Troy. That's where it goes into uh, kind of what I said earlier is, um, <clears throat> I tell people uh, all the time, I said, I'm high speed, low drag. I said, I'm, I'm going to work hard for you, but I'm not going to wear you out. I'll, I'll do what you want at your speed and your level, what, what you want to do. And, um, and people have really, really appreciate that, 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 you know, they're not walking into, I used to tell clients, Oh yeah, I'm not that used car salesman type. And then the client that I had was a used car salesman. He was a little pissed off by that comment. So I don't use that anymore, <laughs> but, uh, um, it, it's the same kind of concept. I don't come at them that hard. You just, you just see what, feel them out as to what they need. That's great. Um, do any of the three of you offer any kind of confidentiality statements when communicating with your clients too? I know, Ann, you had brought up the Missouri disclosure form in your packet, but do you guys really emphasize the fact that you're confidential? I'm well versed in confidentiality because I came from the medical field. So oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't have an actual form per se that I give them, but you know, I say anything that they say to me, I would never tell to the seller unless they tell me they want me to tell them that. For your information. Um, what are you guys using for tools um, to uncover? 
like the needs and wants of the property that they're kind of looking for? Um, are you using like a criteria sheet? Are you just writing down a piece of paper? Like, what does that look like? Um, right there. Uh, if I go first, yeah. Go ahead, Troy. No, that's right, Ann. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, from the beginning, I've got that sheet of what they want. So you just keep referring back to it. I mean, mm -hmm. Maybe they're not going to find the perfect house that has 100% of what they're looking for, but if it's got 80% and 20% is fixable, it could be a win-win. Mm -hmm. What happens if you're, you're finding something that, you know, like the wife wants, but the husband's not finding anything that he wants? If the wife is happy, the husband should be too. <laughs> 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 that's funny I heard a saying once if, if you find 80 per, and I've used this multiple times with clients and they crack up every time but if you find 80% of what you're looking for it's like finding a wife you just take and accept it <laughs> <laughs> that's <a good> one. <laughs> Troy uh, what about you the, uh, if the wife if the wife likes it and the husband doesn't um, you just kind of stand back and don't get in the middle of that um, you know, maybe you, maybe you point out some of the features that the husband did like and things like that. But as we all know, the wife's going to win out. Rarely does the husband. If if the husband wins out, I normally put that one on my calendar. <laughs> um, what kind of tools are, are you guys using, you and Ryan, um, when you're talking with your clients? Are, are you guys using, like, any kind of criteria sheets, packets, like Ann had? had I, I have a... Uh, I have a very, 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 very detailed um, pad that I use, and um, I got it from Michael Lassen. It's a notepad. It's not detailed. It's just a scrap piece of paper. I write all the information down, and then, but I did create a spreadsheet that um, has the date they called in, their name, their phone number, their address, um, the price point that they're interested in and then it's got a note section in the note section i put um lakefront three two those things that trigger you to remember so that um two months from now when we're sitting in a staff meeting and ryan says hey man i got a three two coming up lakefront niangua area blah 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 i'm like oh man that's that's perfect for susie and bill you know and and I go back to my sheet and pull that information and then I can text them right away. we got a new listing coming up, not on the market yet, but, uh, um, uh, and that's just how I keep track of it. And mm -hmm. it just really works. It, it works great for me. That's great. I like how you brought in your Excel spreadsheet, Troy. That that's awesome. Ryan, are you kind of doing anything as far as a packet or tool? No, I don't have any of that kind of stuff, but I mean, obviously I set them up a cart on the MLS, so I have that information in there, but then I also put all that information in my database on my pipeline there, so that way um, every time, like my hot clients, I send them an email or contact them at least once every two weeks, unless I need to do it even sooner. But every conversation I have with them, I make a quick note about what our conversation was, and I have all the information of what they're looking for in there as well. So every two weeks when I'm going through and I'm updating my pipeline, I know exactly what they're looking for, and I also remember the last conversation we had. Mm, that's great. I keep everybody in a folder, too, and I keep the folders right here by my desk. So I'm always looking. I'm always looking through to remind myself who's looking for what. And, uh, yeah, I kind of, I kind of was going to say actually for reminders. Yeah, that's really, that's a really good idea to you. What's kind of, it's on the front of your folders and does it have like information on the front as far as what they might be looking for or is it just their name or? Yeah, these folders have buyers and sellers. Oh, great. Oh, on them. You can order these. Those are really cool. Yeah. You get them Remar remarks and um closing info and uh judy elliott and i ordered these from somewhere i'd have to get the name from judy for where because she's the one that ordered them okay yeah i'll uh pass that on to you guys if anybody wants that information i'll get it from judy um move, moving on a little bit um 
Ryan, after you kind of have uncovered their needs, you've got to gauge and feel for what these buyers are looking for for their next property. Um, what do you kind of think? I know we've had a lot of agents in, previous, in this previous class when we were doing them in seat say that they were really uncomfortable with, with um, asking things like um, checking their financial requirement, basically talking about if they have the money to purchase the property or how they're going to go about doing that. Can you kind of elaborate on on what that sounds like coming from you? Um, yeah, I mean, just it kind of goes back to our first meeting or appointment where we're looking at homes. I, that's where I really start narrowing down. Okay, well, are you guys pre-approved? Like, if they're serious about purchasing, purchasing, that's when I start really talking about financing and stuff. If they're looking and looking and looking, but they're not sure what they want to buy it or I don't really focus too much on the financing aspect of it until they're a little more serious. Once they're more serious, then I start narrowing down, well, okay, are you guys already pre-approved or do you know that you can afford this much? If not, then if they have a lender, I tell them that's probably the first step we need to start with is making sure you guys get pre-approved with them or I'll give them a list of lenders to contact about getting pre-approved. But I don't necessarily do that until I know they're getting more serious about purchasing. Mm -hmm. Troy and Ann, can you elaborate um, on your your side of your guys' businesses, how you talk about a financial requirement for clients? I think it's important if they are pre-approved because I tell them that your offer is going to be strong. You can prove that you are qualified to purchase this home. I mean, it's in your best interest to be uh, pre-qualified and we want to make sure we're looking in the correct price point mm -hmm. to fall in love with something and then we couldn't get it. I like how you put in the price point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of, and uh, I'm kind of a combination of the two of them, exactly the same as what they uh, just said. Yeah, that's, those are really good things to say. I know Mel, for example, she always goes back to, um, anytime she wants to test where they are like, Oh, are you paying cash? Cause most of the time that like never happens. So, but it's an ease into for her into that conversation. And it can, it can get probably pretty tough to, to talk about finances with certain clients. So I know that, um, you know, if you're not comfortable with doing that, that you could probably spar to kind of work on getting that better, maybe spar with, with anybody in this class, um, if you want to work on that. So, um, it's important to get comfortable asking that question because you want to know that they actually are serious and not going to run you around and then not do anything. Well, and Anne, I was just going to ask you like to, to elaborate, elaborate on, you know, testing those, those financial concerns and why that is important. I mean, do you have any, any tools? Like I know some people use like a buying process sheet or they have like a, a spreadsheet that shows like costs of the whole buying process. So I didn't know if any of you three used anything like that to kind of break down what it would be overall um, and talk about that. I don't at the very beginning. I mean, if it gets to the point where they're really serious about putting in an offer and they put the offer in and they're going to, they want to know what their closing costs are going to be, or, you know, mm -hmm. how, how does all the prorations work? And then you can get into it at that point, but at the very beginning, Good suggestion. I probably should, but I don't. <laughs> well, again, getting back to what you're comfortable with. I mean, have you ever um, had a meeting with any of any buyers and just walked away going, man, I really wish I should have covered that? If I don't know the answer to really the question, I, I tell them I'll find out. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can call if, you, if they want to know like what the rate is right then. Call a lender, you know. Usually they'll answer the phone or just try to find out right then. If you can't find out right then, then say, I don't know. It's okay not to know, but I'll get back with you. Absolutely. So um, I kind of wanted to go into um, the roles and expectations, um, covering those and getting the groundwork kind of out of the way. Um, to kind of close this meeting and to hopefully get them to agree to either sign a buyer's agency or work with you exclusively before you break for the first meeting and then take a couple days figuring out what properties you're going to go to and then come back to actually go show properties. So when you guys are 
uh, you know, closing kind of that initial first meeting, you know, our course teaches us to cover those mutual expectations or roles for them as your client, you as the agent. You know, what does that dialogue sound like coming from you guys? Are you doing that? Are you, do you have any tools that you're using? Well, I, it's in my original packet that I give them, you know, tell them I have a risk-free guarantee if for any reason you're not satisfied, just let me know and I'll try to make it work. Or if not, then, you know, we'll, we can part friends, but I tell them I work really hard for my clients and I, you know, basically expect loyalty in return. Mm. I like that you brought up a risk-free guarantee. I know that Judy Lador covered that you could do that um, several different ways. So, and I've, it's been proven to help kind of ease that tension. So, yeah. Josie, do you have a question? I can't hear you. Okay, you might choose the chat box. If you hit chat, you can type your question. Oh, okay. So, Troy and Ryan, do you guys have any other um, dialogue, like, kind of around roles and expectations? I can normally tell after meeting with well, the client. As far as what? Um, around roles and expectations, like your role as the agent, their role as your client. Good, Ryan. Yeah, I don't, as far as going over roles and expectations, I don't really go over much of that. Um, Normally, you know, I just try explaining to them at our showings or in our conversations that I'm here, I'm available in the area of the lake. Um, I just, I leave it up to them if they want to work with me, kind of vice versa. I leave it up to myself if I want to work with them. And if I do, they go on a database and they get followed up with pretty consistently. So I'm kind of like Troy, I don't over overdo it with my clients and I've had good success of them wanting to work with me just because I don't, I don't overdo it with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's important too, Ryan, is, you know, not, not pushing too hard. Like Troy had said too, you don't want to be pushy, mm -hmm. uh, but you also kind of want to walk away knowing that they're going to come back and work with you. So. Yeah. Oh, one other thing. Too. Yeah, I, uh, Go ahead, ahead Troy, but I got a, a comment. I was just going to say that uh, I don't have anything written down. Um, I do go through the process with them as to what the steps are going to be. We may be standing in the house. It may be a text message after the uh, offer has, has been submitted and say, okay, so we get this submitted and uh, then we get it accepted and then we move into this process and this and this and this and let them know kind of what they expect. And um, uh, yeah, that, I just don't have it written down for a, a, just something else I have to give them. So, right. Um, let's talk about the buyer's agency. I know Ryan, you said that you don't really get a buyer's agency signed. Troy and Ann, do you work in a buyer's agency at any point in your processes? When they first come to the office, I give them that contract. I don't make them sign it right away. Um, but just so they're aware of it, that they're aware that I'm going to work hard for them. And uh, another thing that I want to make sure I mention is I also tell them that if they find a for sale by owner, I can represent them in that transaction, that I have called many for sale by owners and gotten them to pay my commission. If for some reason they wouldn't and they wanted me to represent them, you know, then there's a 3% buyer's agency, but just because it's a for sale by owner does not mean you can't use an agent. I've done that many times, call them and, you know, usually they'll agree. I mean, because they can get a professional at a lower rate and mm -hmm. it's always in the buyer's best interest to use an agent. Now I will say I don't ever require a buyer's agency agreement except like if I have buyers looking in a certain condo complex and there's no available units there, so I may do mailers to that entire condo complex saying I have buyers looking, but before I spend any money or do anything like that, I will require them to do a buyer's agency before I do something. 
That's a good point. And I don't do it till uh, until I write the contract. I just I just don't do it. And I've lost a couple situations, but uh, um, of the amount of homes that, that we've sold, uh, two is an acceptable number. Mm -hmm. so. so it's all about comfortability. Again, getting back to what you're comfortable with when you feel like you can slide it in. And, and it probably depends on the client too, as far as your gauge on whether or not you think that they could probably sign one with you as well, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I got a text from uh, Vicki Drake, um, and I wanted to go back to her um, text that she sent me. She's having, uh, she couldn't talk, and we couldn't hear her, just like um, Josie, so I told them they could text me, too. And she said, I, um, I wanted to say that I feel very strongly about a pre-approval letter, considering listing my personal home and believe I would require pre-approval pre letter before showings. I see this more or I am seeing more of this experience this Sunday when showing a serious buyer shouldn't mind doing this. So I wanted to make sure that um, if you guys wanted to elaborate on that for her about a pre-approval letter, if you do any pre-approval letters. Yeah, that seems to be more commonplace anymore is that uh, um, other agents are requiring it. Um, maybe their sellers asking for one. I had one the other day that uh, we were waiting to get uh, pre-approval on and um, uh, that deal just didn't come together because we had to wait till Monday and they got another offer in. Those people had a pre-approval in hand. So, mm -hmm. you know, each situation is a little different and you just got to kind of play it by ear on those. Mm -hmm. But I, I always push to at least tell them to jump on a website with their lender or a couple that I'll send to them and, and get pre-approved. I mean, you don't want to put the cart before the horse. And that's what Ryan said earlier, you know, is that if they, uh, they get pre-approved for 200,000, they're looking at $300,000 home. We're all wasting our time. Mm -hmm. Wasting our time. And you know, there's emotions that go into that too. It, it makes it stressful for everybody. Um, thank you for elaborating on that further, Troy. Um, and then finally, before we run out of time for this part one of uh, buyer's conversion, I kind of wanted to touch on how you guys close that first initial meeting before you kind of take a break and pull property and, and get a game plan for showing and meeting them the next time. So, you know, kind of what does that, that dialogue sound like coming from you guys when you're, when you're ending the meeting? Are you setting the appointment right then? Are you or are you getting back to them in the next couple of days? I mean, what what do you guys do to to ease them and then gain them to meet with you again to show property? That really just varies on per buyer again, on if they're ready to go start looking or if they're wanting to see what I send them first. But at the end of my appointment, I just let them know what I'm going to be doing and when I'll send it to them. And in the meantime, if they need anything, they can reach out to me anyway via phone, text, or an email. Mm -hmm. So I just make sure they have all my contact information, let them know what I'm going back to go do for them right now. And if they need to get a hold of me, they can. That's great. I agree with Ryan. It depends on if it's a, a phone lead, and then you tell them, give them all your information, tell them what you're going to be doing for them. But if it's somebody that's in my office. Typically, we're meeting right before we're going out. We've already established what properties we're going to see. And so that's when I go through my packet of information and give it to them with the folder so they can put all the flyers in there from the different properties and keep it all together. Great. And, uh, and it's like I said earlier, um, I always follow it. I always follow up the next day with a text and that simple text is, hey, did you get my email about those houses I sent to you? Um, hey, uh, the uh, houses we, or the condos we looked at, um, did you have any additional questions I can answer? Or did you get those that email I sent? Any questions that that might generate? Anything like that. Always, 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 always follow it up with a text the next day it's just a simple, easy point of contact that you're making with your client that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come across obtrusive. You know, you're not bugging them or wearing them out. You're just asking a simple question and then follow that up with, Hey, just let you know, I'm here for you. 
let me know if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Um, one final question for you guys um, along the, those same lines. What kind of creative steps have you taken um, with everything going on with COVID? I mean, have you guys, when working with buyers, are you guys doing more virtual things at all? Are you doing more via FaceTime or, or your phone? I've had a few clients who weren't coming down due to everything and I've offered to do, you know, walkthroughs for them and do videos for them but I've still been finding most of my clients right now it hasn't affected them and they didn't care too much about it so they were still willing to come down view the property um, if the seller had asked for us to take precautions as far as wearing gloves or masks then we did do that otherwise we did it like a normal showing mm -hmm. Were you verifying with the um, listing agent on that, Ryan, kind of ahead of time, like if, if you needed to do gloves and, and Yeah, most of the time, I mean, if they wanted us to do that, they were calling us after we scheduled the appointment to ask us to do so. Okay. Those are, those are great. Offering to do the virtuals and stuff. I know a lot of agents have had good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Troy and Ann, have you had anything um, just new that you've tried or, or had to experience? Go ahead, Troy. Um, I, you know, I have, I've actually had a couple of unique situations. Um, well, the first one's not unique. It's just kind of the way we do business anymore. And I try to make light of it to put them at ease. Um, that being that uh, they get out of the car, we get out of the car and um, at, at the showing or I'm there and they pull up and, you know, I give them the old elbow bump or, or point the elbow in their direction and say, hey, we're shaking hands today, you know, and, and, they, and then we all laugh about it. And, and everybody's kind of naturally socially distancing, you know, that six, seven feet and, and try to keep that. So, and that, that's fine. You know, whatever, whatever they're comfortable with, I'm, I'm comfortable with. Okay, so the unique situation that I had was a little scary. And this was, I got a floor call, and I expressed this to our team, Ryan knows this. Um, I got a floor call, guy wants to see a house, it's 11 o'clock in the morning, he wants to see a house at 2, and I'm like, okay, cool. Um, I pull it up, it's an amazing $43,000 Lakeview home, so I know I'm going to retire early now. And um, uh, I said, okay, I'll get that set up, we can see it at 2. He said, okay, um, something I need to tell you though. And I said, oh, what's that? And he says, well, my wife and I both tested positive for COVID-19. Um, we are in remission. We have gone through our uh, uh, quarantine period. And I said, oh, and that started a whole new dialogue. And I said, um, so how'd that happen? He said, well, my dad was sick and he was on hospice care and we think he might've got it through uh, one of the hospice caretakers. Um, he has since died, died. Um, and everyone in my family now has COVID-19. And my brother has died. And I said to myself, I'm like, this dude's like some kind of super carrier or something, you know? Wow. And so I said to him, I said, well, my, my dad just died 20 days ago and I'm with my mom and she's 82 almost every day. And I said, but I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I can't take the chance of showing this house to you. I don't care if it was a million dollars. It wasn't the 43,000. That was amazing in itself. But um, uh, I said, I just can't take that chance. Mm -hmm. And so he understood me. It was our listing. So he says, well, I understand. I said, well, call me back in a couple of weeks and, you know, we'll reevaluate this. So, so I jump off there and I text all this that I just told you to my team and let them all know in case he called someone else on the team to see it because that's how it started. And I didn't want him to say, well, I couldn't see it because I was being honest. Now I won't be so honest and let Ryan show this house. And he takes COVID home to his family and young kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, Troy. That's a, that's a tough one. I, that, that guy didn't have very good, good luck. Yeah. Uh, 
but thank you for sharing that story. I think that's important too, you know, to communicate, even when you're not on a team too, you know, if you run across something like that, you know, shoot it out on synergy or, or in a text or something. If, if you kind of know that other agents might be walking into something bad, not even just COVID, just any kind of inkling or feeling even um, agent safety is something that we'll talk about um, a little bit more on Thursday when we get into part two of this course. But, you know, any type of precautions like that, I think are, are good. And thank you, Troy, for sharing that story. That was a really good story. You're so, welcome. Do you guys have um, any questions before we break for this part one? Like I said, I want to keep it at about an hour. Um, hopefully, if Troy and Ryan and Ann's schedule allows, um, no pressure to you three, but maybe you can come back on Thursday and kind of finish up for part two. That will be at 9 a.m. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Um, if you guys have questions, feel free to just ask via this way, or you can chat or text me, and I'll be happy to reach out to them um, and get answers for you. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. You guys. Yes, thank you. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, wait. Bye. We got Bye. Oh, thanks, Ann, Ryan, and Troy, and Kaylin. Yep. I'm always available for any questions if anybody has any questions, too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. anytime. Thank you so much, guys, for coming. Have a good day.